I have a warning. If you are a Catholic who is serious about their faith, serious about taking Jesus Christ into your life, you need to stop practicing the law of attraction right now. Make no mistake, the law of attraction is dangerous and it is not biblical. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The law of attraction teaches you to rely on yourself. It teaches you that you can wield the powers of the universe to manifest your desires to you. But that's not what the Lord tells us. Jesus Christ told us in the Our Father to pray and to say, Thy will be done. Thy, the Lord's, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We will not experience anything. We will not have anything. We cannot manifest anything that has not been first given to us by God, by His will. Which means, at the end of the day, you're not going to have everything your heart desires. And the law of attraction teaches you that if you don't manifest correctly or if you focus on negativity, you won't get the things that you're thinking about. Wrong, wrong, wrong. This is not the way and it's very dangerous for your soul. You are purchasing a one-way ticket straight to hell with the Law of Attraction. This is going to be a two-part series where we break down the Law of Attraction, its history, and what it says against scripture, what it believes, what it teaches, and what the Bible says about manifesting our desires. In today's conversation, we are going to dig deep into the Law of Attraction, where it came from, and the people behind it. You might have heard the names Jerry and Esther Hicks. They are the most prominent teachers of the Law of Attraction as we know it today. And in today's video, we are going to break down the history of the Law of Attraction and give you the tools that you need to make the decision to walk away with your soul saved. That's what we're going to talk about today on That Black Catholic Chick. Now, I know my opener probably got some of you really riled up. You probably think I'm absolutely insane. I'm being way too dramatic that the law of attraction isn't that bad. But I want to tell you that I'm not talking about this from a standpoint of never having followed the law of attraction. Honey, I led my life by the law of attraction for very many years. This is a copy of my very own book by Jerry and Esther Hicks, who we're going to get into today. I practiced the law of attraction for, I, I would say for about a good three to four years of my life pretty seriously. And I would have attributed so much of my own success in my life to manifesting my desires and blaming the fact that I didn't see certain things come to fruition on myself. It's my fault. I wasn't manifesting hard enough. But the more I got back into my faith, the more I went deeply into scripture, studying the Bible, really learning about Christ's message to us, the more I saw how dangerous this message is and how false it is. In fact, we can go right to scripture and hear Jesus Christ tell us himself in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There is just so much out there in our culture today that I think that people are just searching for. People are searching for the answers and because culture has become so secular, the mention of God and spirituality is such a hot button topic that you have people who turn to the new age in order to fill that void that's missing once you take God out of the equation. And the law of attraction falls really nicely into that. Another reason why I think the law of attraction has such an appeal is because we're in this culture that is an instant gratification culture, we're in this culture that is materialistic, a lot of times when we think about the law of attraction, people are trying to attract wealth or trying to attract objects and vices and all of these things, things that are of the material world. And very few times you hear anyone talking about actually manifesting their own spirituality to a higher degree. It's always about acquiring things. And I think that's a very dangerous message. And even more, with our culture today, people don't go back and learn. They don't go back and do research. They hear something online. They hear something on social media. They hear something that one of their favorite influencers says, and they take it as gospel. They take it as this is correct information. The law of attraction has a very deep and seedy history, and it's rooted in new age spirituality. 
And that's what I want to get into today. I want to show you the man behind the wizard, the one that's in the back there cranking up all of the levers and making this whole thing go off and making you believe that this is real when it's not, it's very dangerous. So how did we get here? You can trace the law of attraction way back to about the late 19th century, 1800s, early 1900s, and then into the 1920s, where this idea of manifestation and thoughts becoming thing becomes a really large part of the culture and what people started to turn to to believe. The law of attraction at its core, it teaches that people are pure energy and everything around us is pure energy and that we can attract things either negative or positive just by changing the way that we think. You can improve your health, your wealth, your personal relationships, anything that you can bring to mind, you can make better. You can have a positive experience with it if you just think about it being that way. But so many times what we don't hear about is when things don't go right. Now, the origins of this can be traced back to a man named Phineas Quimby. Now, Quimby hails from the 19th century. And at one point in his life, he was stricken by tuberculosis, which was no cure for. He started taking up horseback riding and he started to realize by him doing that and being involved in rigorous exercise that it made him feel a lot better. And this prompted him to look into this in a deeper way. And he started to develop this thought of mind over matter, like like mind over body, basically. Now, although he never actually used the words the law of attraction, this is what he said about his findings. The trouble is in the mind, but the body is only the house for the mind to dwell in. And we put a value on it according to its worth. Therefore, if your mind has been deceived by some invisible enemy into a belief You have to put it into the form of a disease, with or without your knowledge. By my theory or truth, I come in contact with your enemy and restore you to your health and happiness. This I do partly mentally and partly by taking till I correct the wrong impressions and establish the truth and the truth is the cure. So already you can see By the time he's developing this work, he's laying the groundwork and the foundation for what we know today as the law of attraction. But that's not all. By 1855, the actual word, the law of attraction, appeared in a publication. And it was written by a guy named Andrew Jackson Davis, who started to talk about the spiritual world and the spiritual body and how we can manifest the powers of the world and the universe around us to get outcomes that we want. Now, fast forward years later, by the time we get to the 1920s, this kind of mindset started to really pick up. And if you think about that time period, there was a lot of people that were into like spiritualism and seances and the dead in this period of like the late 1800s all the way through the 1920s and longer. And in the 1920s, there was a specific person who wrote a book that I know you heard of because everyone to this day reads it, including myself. What's that book? Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Now, this is going to play an important role later on when we get to the authors of the actual Law of Attraction book that I showed you here, Jerry and Esther Hicks. Now, a lot of people started to really hear about the Law of Attraction in around 2005, 2006 with the release of the blockbuster hit, The Secret. But before The Secret came out, There was a couple who was laying the foundation for what we know today as a modern day law of attraction, and that is Jerry and Esther Hicks. The woman who wrote The Secret, her name is Rhonda Byrne, and she was actually the business partner of Esther Hicks. And there was like a rift between them. They separated ways and she took off with The Secret based off of the work that they did. So basically, she stole their work, ran off with it and made a fortune. However, Esther and Jerry Hicks still went on to be very popular. And even to this day, Esther Hicks is pushing her version of the law of attraction well after her husband, Jerry, died. But how did we get here? Let's go ahead and talk about the root of the law of attraction. And then I want to bring something to your attention, how this work could well be very demonic. Oh, honey, strap in. We're about to have a long conversation. Hey, let me ask you this. Are you looking to sell your home or are you looking to buy a new one? Well, let me tell you, you've got to check out our friends over at Real Estate for Life because honey, they will get you connected with a faith 
based real estate agent who can help you to find the perfect community for you and your family. Listen, we got to stick together when it comes to faith and building up our community. I know how important it is for you to be in a community of other Catholics with a strong sense of faith, strong sense of value, where your children and you can feel safe. You can fellowship with other people who hold your same values. Listen, you've got to run. Do not walk. Run right away to their website, realestateforlife.org, and then tell them that Roxy sent you and get your dream home by the grace of God today. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at the main founder, who is Jerry Hicks. Now, this man is like an enigma. There's not a lot of information about him. There's a lot of mystery shrouded around his early life. But what we do know is that according to him and according to his own words in this Law of Attraction book, he was raised without having a sense of religion. His family was not religious at all. And there's one point in his life where he started to have this calling for something deeper, something greater. You, we all know that calling when God takes a knock on your heart and is asking for you to open the door to let him in. Well, Jerry Hicks felt that in his own life. And he went on a quest to discover different religions, to figure out where he should be and what he believes. Now, a lot of us have been on that journey ourselves. And it takes a lot of discernment to know what you should believe and what denomination or where you will settle with when it comes to your beliefs. Well, guess what? For Jerry Hicks, he took a look at Christianity and he didn't like it. He didn't like the fact that many of denominations said they are the way, the truth, and the light. No one else is and everyone is damned to hell. That really bothered him. It bothered his consciousness. So he threw it all away and went searching for more answers as to why are we here? What is, is there anything greater beyond ourselves? Now, at some point, Jerry was at a party with some friends and he had an encounter with a Ouija board. Yes, guys, this is where it starts to get good. He has this encounter with the Ouija board. Now, he didn't really necessarily believe that the thing did anything. But as he was sitting there with his friends asking it questions, it began to move. And he asked the Ouija board one question. How can I become truly good. Now think about yourself for a moment in your own spiritual journey. I'm pretty sure this is a question that you asked yourself every single day as a Catholic. How can I become good? How can I become better? How can I live a life reflected in Christ? Now imagine taking that question and asking it to a Ouija board. We know this is about to go left, okay? Because those things are just the portal to evil. So the Ouija board had an amazing answer for him. It told him to read. So then Jerry asked it, okay, read. Read what? The Ouija board answered and told him any and all books by Albert Schweitzer. Now, if a Ouija board is telling you to read some books by some man, you probably want to go ahead and not read them books. But guess what Jerry did? Jerry went off and found those books and he started reading it. And this is where it gets interesting. Schweitzer's most famous work took a look at the historical Jesus Christ. In fact, the book was called The Quest for the Historical Jesus. But who exactly is Schweitzer and why is this important in this story? Now, Schweitzer was born in Kaisersburg, which was in Alsace, which was a part of the German Empire back in the day. And it would later, Alsace, I believe, would later become part of France. But Anyway, that's neither here nor there. What's really interesting is that he was the son of a Lutheran pastor. So he's someone who was brought up in Christianity, someone who was brought up in the Lutheran church. And the man was an absolute genius, a theologian, a mathematician or something like that. He was a musician. He had all of these titles. And it was his passion to study the life of Christ and study the life of Christ from a more historical type of standpoint. That you're going to get... You're going to fall out of your seat with this one, okay? So in his work, what he discovered is this. He felt that the Jesus of the Bible was an apocalyptic Jesus. It was a Jesus that was a tyrant that no one could relate to. In fact, what he taught was that the Jesus of the synoptic gospels was someone who demanded radical devotion, someone who demanded for people to just leave everything behind to follow him, someone who preached about the imminent kingdom of God, right? And he said that in the modern culture of his day, that that message was not realistic and that it was not the way that people should be embracing Christ. Does that sound familiar? This guy, Schweitzer, was saying that to follow in the ways of Christ, the Christ of the Bible, that the modern day man just simply couldn't do it 
And we needed a version of Christ that was more palatable to the society of the day. That was back in like the early 1900s, 1800s or so. So imagine like that time period and where we are today in that way that people talk about Christ in this same way. Guys, we've been fighting this spiritual battle for a long time. And this is the man that Jerry Hicks, he learned from. This is the foundation for the law of attraction, but it gets even worse than that. So Schweitzer believed that Jesus's fiery message of forsaking your family and just going full in for him was too much to bear. So instead, what he said was this. He wanted to draw on the trends in German Protestantism, and he simplified the message of Christ, teaching more about the fatherhood of God, like God being the loving, gentle father, the brotherhood of man, and some elements of social justice, which he felt were more relevant than what was in the Bible. So he basically went in, put Protestantism all over it, and changed the word of God to make it palatable for the people of his day. He even went as far as challenging the way that Jesus saw himself, saying that people in the Bible saw him as different things, as the son of God, the son of man, about a prophet, a healer. So we can't even deduct how Jesus felt because people saw him differently. This guy's insane, okay? This is the man in which Jerry Hicks followed in order to start to build his spirituality and what he believed. Schweitzer's main push was to get the common person to have a self-perceived vision of Christ, a vision that would evolve over time to fit the modern era. Now, when we fast forward to Jerry Hicks, when he read this work, it made him realize that we are allowed to interpret Jesus Christ however we want, that however we see him, that is who he is, that there's not just one way to look at Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, for whatever reasons, Jerry Hicks felt that after going into all of this, that both the Ouija board and what he found with Schweitzer was not enough. There's something more. There's something greater. So he went further searching. Now, Jerry Hicks has had a number of jobs over time. He was at one point a comedian. He was like a gymnast or or an acrobat or something like that. He was doing all these other things. And he eventually found his way to selling Amway. Now, if anyone knows about Amway, it's a kind of like a multi, like one of those MLM type of companies, but they sold like products or something like that. It's like old school. It's one of the largest MLM companies in the world. That's how they tout themselves. He was one of their biggest sellers back in the day. And part of their requirements is that people went off and read books. They're not people. Well, their employees went off and read books to help them to become better salespeople. One of the books that he read was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And that really changed his perspective on a lot of things. He was completely taken aback and blown away by this thought of thoughts becoming things, of you manifesting whatever you want just by thinking of it and attracting it to you. Now, the interesting thing is, is that he started to put this in action and thought he saw all these positive things happening in his life. And at the same time, he was running like these seminars and all these self-help kind of workshops. And he was trying to teach it to other people, but he was realizing that what he was able to do for himself, he was not able to replicate and get that for other people. So other people were trying this whole like manifestation, thinking myself rich and all that other stuff, my thoughts become things, and they were failing miserably. So he wanted to go even deeper to find out why he was able to be successful, but the folks that he's working with couldn't. So this sent him on another search. The benefits of this search, right? Mr. Hicks has already been married about four or five times. Now, along the way, he ended up meeting this woman at a workshop of his named Esther Weaver. And he would eventually go on and marry Miss Esther Weaver, and she would become Esther Hicks, his wife. Now, Esther was significantly younger than him, and she he was far more successful than she was. And from what I've gathered, she wasn't really into the whole like Ouija board thing. And she wasn't really into all of the stuff that he was into. But he saw a future and a way to really grow his venture by going into more of this like seance type of stuff. And he would eventually go on and try to convince her to come on board with this. Jerry ends up finding this book called Seth Speaks. And in it, The author would go into this trance, which would allow her to connect to this otherworldly being who would reveal these truths to her. 
And when he discovered this, this was like kind of like this mind blowing jackpot for him to the point to whereas he kept on trying to convince Esther that this was a great thing for them to look into. And I think eventually she goes ahead and she opens her heart to it. And what he explains in the book, The Law of Attraction, is that for him, he goes off of his feelings for everything. So if something feels good, it feels right, then he knows that it's something that he wants to pursue. Now, what's dangerous about that, right? See, if this man was into the scripture, he would know that your feelings are the most dangerous things to rely on. The Bible tells us to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So here we got this guy out here who thinks that doing seances and using the Ouija board and all this stuff is a great idea to try to introduce his ideas to the masses. Do you under, do you understand and do you see now why I'm telling you that this stuff is rooted in occultism? This stuff is rooted in mysticism. And again, it's stuff that should not even be consumed by you as a practicing Catholic. Jeremiah 79 says the following, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? Mr. Hicks couldn't understand what the heck he was doing if he was relying on these things and these messages to find that emptiness within him to connect to God. You guys, this stuff, again, is dangerous. We're not even done yet. Let's go on. Now, it's at this point that he convinced Esther that doing this channeling, channeling stuff is fantastic and they should look into it. So eventually they find someone, a mentor, who can help them to get into channeling and to tap into the spirit world. And Esther is the one who took front center with that. Now, she becomes the main conduit behind the spirit called Abraham. Abraham is a collection of 100 spiritual beings, including Jesus Christ himself, who speaks to Esther and gives her messages to give to the world. And at the heart of that message is the law of attraction and you manifesting your heart's desires. Now, it's at this point that I would absolutely love to go into a video that I found online of Esther talking about Abraham what Abraham is and her going into this actual trance. Now, here's the thing, Esther, she likes to go ahead and copyright strike anyone who shares any videos of hers online. So we're not going to include that clip here, but I will put it down below in the description of this video so you can see this in action. Who and what is Abraham? We are non-physical consciousness. We are source energy. We are vibration. We are thought. We are not so different from you. You are an extension of that which we are. Everything that is physical is an extension of that which is source, you see. And so we are just a purer form of the energy that is actually you, meaning we do not have thoughts of resistance that keep us from being that which is a vibrational match to source, while in your physical form, sometimes you do. Bruh. Why the name Abraham? The process that Esther uses to interpret for us is a process where she receives blocks of thought, sort of like downloading to a computer, if you will, like radio signals. And Esther receives the block of thought at an unconscious level and then finds, also at an unconscious level, the physical word equivalent. So even the label Abraham was a label that Esther fashioned at an unconscious level because it was the best descriptive word that explained easily in one label, like you want your names to be, that which we are. And what I want to point out is that I want you to not be fooled by the name Abraham. This is not Abraham, the God of Israel. This is not Abraham of the Bible. This is not Abraham that had the covenant with our Lord. No, this is a collection of a hundred or more spiritual beings of which actually Jerry Hicks is a part of now because he died back in 2011. Oh, honey, we got to get into that whole thing. This guy who's teaching people that you can overcome sickness, you can, you can change your health, you can overcome death to a great degree. If you don't want to die, you don't have to die. The man ends up getting sick with brain cancer and dies back in 2011. And I remember when that happened because I was just floored about what the heck are they going to do? There's no way they can save face. For whatever reason, you know, listen, people are very gullible when it comes to matters of spirituality. Esther Hitz picked right back up, honey. And for the last 12 years, my girl's been doing this on her own, channeling Jerry and Abraham at the same time, talking to her from the spirit world. Okay, you do without what you want. You do without what you want. 
Now, I want to go ahead and wrap this video up. This first part of our conversation, because remember, this is going to be a two part series, honey. OK, because we're going to be talking about breaking down exactly what the law of attraction believes bullet point by bullet point and then pointing out in scripture where they try to use our Bible. They try to use our Holy Bible to say that this stuff supports, the Bible supports all of this stuff. And I want to slice it, dice it, and show you as a Catholic who's trying to get closer to Jesus Christ, why you need to leave this alone. But the following scriptures talk about channeling and why it's dangerous and why we shouldn't do it. So that way you know, without a doubt, you cannot refute the word of God. Esther Hicks, the law of attraction, use channeling to build this foundation. And although you have the secret, which kind of took her work, her and Jerry's work, and flipped it with another name, another face, and got it on Oprah, it's still the same root. And now you've got coaches from around the world, coaches, law of attraction coaches, you've got influencers who talk about this, but they have no idea of the origins, you guys. Just because you don't know the origins, it doesn't make it less powerful. Think about this. People might come to our Holy Mass and they might say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in the Holy Eucharist. I don't believe that Jesus' presence is there and the bread and wine. They might say that, but guess what? It doesn't make it true just because they say that, right? They try to take out the spirituality behind it and say, eh, I don't believe it, so it's okay. You can't do that. You cannot do that. And those of you who are trying to do that with the law of attraction, you are dead wrong. Let's get into what the Lord said about channeling and spirit. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31 states, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritualists for you will be defiled by them. Leviticus chapter 20, verse six says, I will set my face against the person who turns to mediums and spiritualists to prostitute himself by following them, and I will cut him off from his people. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 12 says that consulting mediums or channeling the dead is detestable. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Those are the reasons why this completely conflicts with your beliefs as a Catholic and why you need to step away from the law of attraction. The Lord tells us to seek him, to live in him and we shall be fruitful, to ask him and we shall be received. But Jesus Christ explicitly tells us in the Our Father, thy will be done. When Jesus prayed in the garden before his death, he did not want to die in that moment while he was praying because he asked three times for the Lord to pass this cup, the Lord to spare him and pass this cup. But he said something else very important. Jesus Christ in that moment was trying to manifest his own saving. If you want to go ahead and put the law of attraction on that, right? But the next thing that he said, but if it is your will, let it happen to me. So he prayed three times for the cup to pass. But if it is your will, let it be done. If it is your will, and it was the will of God, it was the will of the Father, and he died for our salvation. If Jesus Christ himself cannot manifest his own saving from dying on the cross because it is the will of God for him to do that, what makes you think that you have the power to wield the universe to give you your frivolous askings? You want wealth. You want power. You want all these vices. You want to control people. You want people to fall in love with you, to adore you. And you think that by asking the esoteric universe that you can have these things. You can't have anything without the Lord. You cannot have anything without living in the Lord. You cannot have anything without the Lord willing it to be yours. And if it's not, it's not your fault. It's not yours to have. We are going to get deep into this conversation. The next conversation that you need to go ahead and watch, because this is a two-part series, and who knows, I might do a third part. But part two, I want to break down the beliefs of the law of attraction, exactly bullet point by bullet point, what it's all about and how it contradicts with our beliefs as Catholics. So you are not going to want to miss that. Go ahead right away and watch this video right over here, and I'll see you over there.